everyone. It is so great to be here. This is Joyce Davis, and I am the president and the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And as many of you know, I'm also Pin Lives Outreach and Opinion Editor. But we are here for a, what I think is, is a really special event. It is to connect with the artists in our community. Look, we all know we have been through a lot. Everyone has been through a lot. It's kept us home. It's kept us out of restaurants, but it's also kept us out of the gallery sometimes and the theaters and the symphony halls and all of the places that we know we love to go to get refreshed and connected to our communities. So tonight, I we have invited the World Affairs Council as part of our Global Artists Initiative. We've invited some very highly acclaimed and respected artists in our region to come together and let's have a community conversation on how they're doing, how you are doing as artists. And um, I just want to say that this is the beginning of a conversation that we're going to have because uh, I want to, I think we ought to stay in contact and make sure that we are providing many opportunities for our artists to connect. But first I'm going to, the way it's gonna work is that we're going to simply introduce, I'm gonna say a little bit about our speakers, who's here. Look, I can't say everything about them because these folks are doing stuff. Okay, their, their bios and their are, is just forever. I'd be here forever with it, but I'm gonna give you a little tidbit and then I'm gonna go around and ask each of, one of them to share with us. They're artists, they know how to share, that's what they live for. <laughs> so I don't think it's gonna be pulling teeth. So first we have with us uh, tonight, Matthew Heron, who's executive director of the Harrisburg Symphony. That's a big job. Uh, Heron grew up in Lancaster before attending Juilliard. 
the Juilliard School, where he earned a Bachelor of Music and Master of Music degrees in cello performance. And now he has worked with the symphony before, but it was as a performer. Now he's running things. And we have Raina Wooden, uh, who's dear to my heart. She was born in Harrisburg, PA in 1976. And she's known as Raina 76, artist R76. She studied hospitality management at Howard University in Washington, DC. And she has dreamed of owning a chain of hotels like President Trump, I guess. I don't know, we'll hear about that. But anyway, her paintings has been exhibited in the, at WITF's atrium, the Art Association of Harrisburg, and they hang in private collections in New York, Philadelphia, all over, right? Uh, so Carrie Whistler Thomas, another uh, very highly esteemed person in our CEO of the Art Association of Harrisburg. Now she holds a BA in Fine Arts from Hood College and her master's degree from Temple. Uh, prior to employment as president of the Art Association, she was a freelance artist, instructor, and art writer. She's held many uh, exhibitions and uh, of her own oil paintings and participated in numerous groups and invitational shows. And we also have Ashley Nicole Wachowiak, and she is a survivor of rape and stalking, she says, and she uses her various forms of art to speak about trauma. She once uh, was a fine art photographer and gallery owner, and she's curated many uh, uh, shows. And uh, her first book, Found, Still Lost, was published by Sunbury Press in Testament to the Abandonment of Trauma, the first publication sold out and is now in second print. So Ashley joined the HeartShine team to curate art shows and community space for dialogue and sharing, kind of like we're doing tonight. Melissa Nicholson is executive director and co-founder of Gamut Theater. She's worn many hats in a professional theatrical career, including actor, director, playwright, teacher, and she's written 25 original plays, past president of the Shakespeare Theater Association. Uh, and she's also a founding board member of the Harrisburg Area Theater Alliance. Now, Maria James Chow is a poet, performer, educator. We have her with us every year when we do our, our International Poetry and Storytelling Festival on, on MLK evening. But she is an award-winning poet, performer, playwright, and now an educator as well. Um, she, her publications include poetry view, re, and reviews in several literary journals, such as New Letters, Cutthroat Journal of the Arts, One Trick Pony Review, and Black Magnolias. Um, and we have FL Frank Henry, who's founder and artistic director of Narcisse Theater Company. Uh, it is a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to uniting the local arts community and developing artists from outside the mainstream. And finally, but not least at all, is Dana Payne, very important lady with us, who is a director of DEI initiatives, Diverse Cultural and Heritage Initiatives with the PA Council on the Arts. And Dana has a singular job of really supporting these artists and making sure that our communities are nurtured and are enriched by, by diverse forms of art, including and making sure we don't forget the many different cultures that we have here to feed into our spirits. So guys, that's the opening and that's a lot for people to digest, <laughs> but you guys are doing something and it's important that they know the caliber of people we have with us tonight. So I wanna start by turning to Matthew because um, Matthew, you, you, you came in at a time of crisis and you've had to steer this ship through the crisis. So why don't you start off by telling us how you're doing and how is the symphony doing? Thank you, Joyce. And you're absolutely right. Uh, when all of this began, I was in Fayetteville, Arkansas doing a similar job. Um, I had accepted this one around February 1st, but we didn't know what was really gonna play out. So I arrived here in, in June. Uh, and at first we were, we at Harrisburg Symphony, like every orchestra around the world was, we were stunned. We didn't quite know where to start, when to start, how much to invest in starting, because there was a lot of talk of, you know, at first we thought this was going to be a couple of weeks. And then we thought it was going to be sort of six weeks and we'll be back in October. Um, so once we got over that and sort of dug into the, the long game, uh, we've gotten into a rhythm Sorry for the pun. We've gotten into a good system 
of online content. Um, we've been doing a YouTube show since August monthly, and we've been doing concerts almost monthly. I think we've had five so far, and we'll have five more planned. Um, and those are, of course, what we do is based on gathering people together. So for now, this is the best option we have. And it has been very satisfying and very rewarding. It's not, nothing is the same as a live performance. Um, but we, once we got over the hump of sort of shifting and learning all the tech and, and taking our patrons with us and figuring out how it mechanically worked, uh, it feels good that we're, we're back in the music business because there was a moment there when we, we had sort of an existential crisis, I think like a lot of us did. Absolutely. Now, now how have the performers coped? I mean, individually, how, how are they dealing with this? That's, the, that's a tough one. Um, it varies from person to person. I mean, we have 74 or 75 musicians who are employed by us year round, you know, September to May. Uh, some of them have secondary jobs. Some of them have a lot of freelance jobs. They may have a lot of students. They may have a university job. They may teach in public education. Uh, they may play in six other orchestras like ours and they drive all year long, spend a week in each place. So their experiences have been all over the board. Um, some of them are struggling and we're, we're very fortunate that we've been able to be in a position where we pay them just a little more than half of what they would make from us, whether or not they come to yeah. play, uh, which is uh, remarkable, I think. I'm very grateful that we can do that. Um, and some of them have fallen on hard times. I mean, I think the underlying, the theme of between all of them is that they miss performance and they miss the audience because this is this is such a part of their identity i'm a musician uh you know and when i when i became an administrator there was a quite a period like a year or longer when i thought well who which one am i you know you're so close when you play an instrument it's a it's such a physical experience it's connected to you you do it for probably since childhood. So it's very disorienting to have that removed from your, from your psyche. Right, right. Uh, and, and, and you're saying that the financial side though is important. Many of these of people have families, right? And so yes. have, have they been able to keep their head above water, so to speak? I mean. Everyone that I've heard of, yes. Okay. Right. Um, but I'm sure that this, this uh, you know, everyone has different circumstances. Now, one other question before I, I, I pull in some, you know, go to the others. How has the support, community support been? Have you been able to keep people, I mean, <laughs> engaged, you know? We have, we have. Uh, people have been remarkably generous uh, and they know, they know everything I just explained to you or, or they, you know, we've told them in case if they didn't know. I think they're, they're very aware of the human element of all of this. It's not just running a business. I mean, a business is made up of people. Mm -hmm. Arts are made up of people uh, and our audience has, we've been very honest with them from the beginning, even in July and August when we said, we don't know what's going to happen, but we will tell you as soon as we know. And I think that served us well. And th their giving has been very solid. Um, very good, Matthew. Matthew, I'm going to come back to you because we still want to talk about the future and all of that, but I'm going to move to Carrie Whistler Thomas and how is the Art Association of Harrisburg doing and how are you doing, Carrie? You have to unmute, Carrie. Let's see if I can unmute you. There you go. Can, yep. You can hear me. Great. Yep. Thank you, Joyce, for convening this great group of panelists. The Art Association actually is doing very well. We were closed from March 16th through June 22nd, but then we reopened. Our gallery reopened to the public and uh, Rena, in fact, had the longest la uh, lasting show in living memory there. She and Charlie Feathers had a show opening last February. And because we were on lockdown, her show was up through June. It was tremendous. And uh, anyway, people did come to see it on appointments. So she was very well known with us for a long time. <laughs> but af after we reopened, we had a show of our Headley collection in the summer. And we uh, had our summer semester classes. And it was so gratifying, Joyce. We had a lot of students signing up. Uh, we didn't do the classes online. They were in person using social distancing and masks. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And people were so happy to come back to classes in person. Right. And then we had our fall membership show, La Petite, which uh, all the members responded beautifully to. Everybody had to do small format pieces. And then that debuted on Gallery Walk Day. We actually ran Gallery Walk very successfully. Again, all the galleries through social distancing only allowed a few people in at a time, but it worked so well. And that show was on through the beginning of December. We had to cancel a whole bunch of our invitational exhibits because we couldn't do receptions. But we did, we did have our jury show online in the summer. We had the fall member show in person. And then we had a great invitational just ended. And now we have our winter membership show. And it's so cool. The winter membership show is always figuratively speaking with a lot of nudes. This year, we had a tweak. Everybody had to tie it in somehow with the pandemic. So we have the most creative of shows you can imagine. Rachel, our curator, is still installing it, but we've got uh, news with masks. We've got artists painting in bathrobes, showing what they did during lockdown. The best of show is the artist Steve Wetzel wearing his bathrobe, holding a groundhog, and it's called Art in the Year of COVID. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah. It's really a great show. So people can see it in person. Rachel's going to do a video tour for those who can't come into the gallery. And she's also going to feature one of the prize winning pieces each week on social media. So we'll have both the in-person experience and social media. But our winter classes are going on and people are happy to be there. They really like the in-person classes. We have classes now at uh, Reservoir Park as well as in our building. And a new extension is the Paper Lion Gallery in uh, Le Moyne. Chuck Schultz is teaching several classes for us over there. He's got lots of space, social distancing and masks again. So people like the in-person experience. We're doing some things virtually, most in person, and people really appreciate that. We had to cancel a bunch of stuff in the summer. We had to move our gala from last April to this coming May, which will be virtual. And we had to postpone our, our soirees from last summer to this coming summer, but we're, we're doing okay. And thanks to the Council on the Arts and thank you to the government for the PPP loans, the forgivable loans, we're doing okay. We've not laid anybody off. We have six employees. We're continuing to pay them and we're open for everybody to come in and enjoy as long as they wear masks. Sure, sure. As long, they have, well, that's it. They have to wear masks. They have to, I guess, maintain social distance, right? And you have right. less things for Correct. washing hands and sanitizing the hands available, right? Oh, we have sanitizer everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and everybody's very good. They were here during gallery walk. Oh, that's my Scotty dog, Gimli. He wants to be part of the meeting. That's all right. I love dogs. I have a Malamute, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. He's very participatory. Okay. And I, as far as my, me, myself, uh, being an artist, I've gotten some paintings done during some of the days we were on lockdown because I moved my, my whole office home, but then I also had some time to paint. Many of our artist members, our 500 plus artist members, have been turning out great things. They've been posting them on Facebook. We've been sharing them. Uh, they're, they're using the time off to create and we're providing opportunities with our membership shows, our sales gallery and our community shows, which are still going on. We're providing opportunities to show their work. Very good, very good. Well, it sounds like you have been resilient, which was the theme that we had, resilience in all of this, right? So we'll come back to this. I do want to talk about, you know, clearly a lot of this has put extra burdens, financial burdens on you as well. I mean, with all of the PPP and all of that stuff that people have to do, but, uh, and we'll come back and talk about just how you've coped with all of that. But Ashley, let's bring you into the conversation. How are you doing and how is Heartshine? Tell us about Heartshine too. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Joyce, for bringing us all together to chat tonight. It's a nice way to spend the evening. I got to shuffle my kids out a bit too. So this is like, you know, mommy artist time. Um, Heartshine is a startup nonprofit 
committed to building a trauma-informed and resilient community. And we're just in our baby stages and we're hoping to open doors and launch our community arts program in 2020, but clearly that didn't happen. Um, but it did uh, force us to pause and think about how we can create space for sharing, even if it's not in person. So we launched a Facebook group for artists to discuss the overlaps of trauma and art. And, um, you know, are you, are you using your trauma to, to inform your art? Are you using art to avoid your trauma? And, and, and all of those intersections, right? Um, and it's been really interesting considering that uh, every single person has been impacted by the pandemic, which certainly falls under the umbrella of trauma, right? Um, we've had great dialogue and conversations about using art to mentally, you know, survive over the last year. And, um, you know, our group is, you know, filled with artists who sell their work and, and artists who don't share their work with anyone, um, but use it, you know, for self-processing. And many, many of us, myself included, have certainly used art as a way to, you know, cope right? Sometimes as a way to connect, sometimes as a way to avoid, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but it's, it's, it's been an incredible, you know, experience to try to launch something during all of this and have to be innovative and, and pivot in a different direction. But, but clearly, I, I would think many of your artists have had a voice, have found a voice during this time, right? I mean, it's not like there's not enough to write about, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting that that you say that specifically. Um, I, myself um, and, and a few others were just talking recently about how we found a lack of individual creativity. Um, you know, I wasn't writing for a while. I didn't pick up my camera or, or a pencil. I just felt flat. Um, and maybe I was drained from homeschooling and teleworking, right? Like that's definitely a possibility. Right. But I, I think it was more likely that the feelings of isolation just completely penetrated my creativity for a while. And um, when I was able to connect with another artist and, and we talked and we brainstormed and we sort of imagined together and committed ourselves to, you know, okay, so when we're out of lockdown, this is the, this is the thing we're gonna go and, and create. Um, I felt more like myself and then I was able to, to find, you know, my spark and my creativity again, but it, you know, it really took um, finding a way to to bridge that isolation gap and connect with another human being for me to for me to find that again. So you needed that community, that kind of people in a reaction to feed your creativity, right? I, I did. Right, but there are some uh, people, writers in particular, who simply close the door and create their own worlds, right? How how did they? <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and and you know we've had a lot of folks you know share that that they're they're writing more now than 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 they ever have, um, and um, one of them reminded me just the other day that that Picasso had this great quote about isolation. He said, um, "Without great solitude, no great art is possible," and. I don't know if that's I don't I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's true for everyone. I don't know if it's true for all great art, but um, it it certainly has been the case for for many many artists. Right, right. That, that I think that's fascinating. So maybe we'll come back and 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 delve into that a little bit more. But uh, Reina, how are you? <laughs> Share with us what has it been like for you, and your creativity. Nope. Hi everyone, how are you? This is Raina 76 Artist. You know the vibes, that's my tagline. How are you today? Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, this has definitely been an interesting year for me personally. Uh, I'm very grateful for therapy. Uh, I wanna be very upfront about that. I embrace self therapy two years ago and boy it didn't come you know in handy for me personally um so some of the challenges that i have been having uh through COVID is finding more creative ways to exhibit my work and getting out there and encouraging myself 
and my partner, Charlie Feathers, to not give up. Um, and uh, so we have been very fortunate there to have these opportunities to show work. Um, in terms of how it's affected me and my paintings, actually COVID-19 taught me not to be so serious, actually. It taught me to be grateful, to show mercy, uh, to find new ways to be helpful towards the community, towards my family and towards my friends. So my painting style used to be a bit heavy, uh, using a lot of darker colors and darker contexts, but now I've started to move away from that. And I want my art to be a, a teaching tool today. And I also want to encourage people that they too can use art to heal themselves. Wow. So the teaching, is it the, a teaching tool for others, for the community, or a teaching tool for your own self? Right now, I it's more for the community. I used to be extremely selfish. I wanted the sales, baby. You know, I was painting to make money. Uh, and when that... And when COVID took place, it put me in a new frame of mind. I saw people around me going through depression. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what their bill situation was going to be like. Uh, a lot of people didn't have the disposable income to spend on art. And Charlie and I started to do these short uh, videos on how to be creative in your home, to find ways to kind of challenge yourself or your children, et cetera, and just to create a camaraderie with one another. It, it, I mean, you know, like the importance of learning about those around you is key and art helps to bring that forward, yes. So Raina, it sounds like you got a new sense of community and of your connection to community despite this horrible COVID stuff, right? Absolutely, I took a lot for granted. My last trip before COVID was to New York City. And for those art heads who love the world of art, I went to visit um, Jerry Saltz, the New York Times critic. He held a big seminar, no masks, you know, <laughs> if there was no social distancing. I felt very comfortable traveling up there. And then two weeks later, we were on lockdown, okay? And I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. Um, and I had to slow myself down right. uh, and realize the importance that it isn't about the sales. Right. Uh, mutually, I think you need to mute Carrie. What? I, we just muted so that your dog is coming in. <laughs> but go oh, ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Ray. <laughs> it's all right. The dog is here. The dog is in my <laughs> house. She wants to express herself. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. but, but you didn't get sick or anything, right? You were you were okay. You didn't get sick. Even despite your traveling, right? They had to mute you. Oh, <laughs> Joyce. We've been tested twice for COVID. Mm -hmm. okay. We wanted to be extremely careful uh, and I take it very seriously. Good, good. And most of my sales today are through the social media platforms and the generosity of those people who understand that although that we can't physically see each other, the artists out here, very few of us have um, saving, uh, you know, yeah. savings right. per se. <laughs> Most of us are living sales by sales. And so I really had to um, rethink the way I treated money and sales and not just for the high, so to speak, but to have a long-term plan. Great. Well, what we want to do too is tell people how they can even see your work now. If it's somebody like me that's at home, because I'm over 60, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> how can I see your work if I want to? Is it online? What? 
Most of my work now is on www.reina76artist.com. And I'm also at the Millworks now and Studio 318. Okay. And um, we are now going to host uh, small shows at the Civic Club now uh, with 20 other artisans. So we're trying to take this online and right. that's another challenge too. We're not really that tech savvy, okay? okay? So I've had to Google a lot of these on even how to use Zoom, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. That's all right. We'll come back to you. And F.L. Henley, Frank, tell us how you're doing and how your theater company is doing, your artists there. Well, hello. Yes. Um, thank you very much for um, including this in this wonderful conversation. I'm honored to be here with such illustrious artists. Um, I'll tell you, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Can't complain. Um, Narcisse Theater Company is very small, very, very small. If COVID was a boulder, we would be a blade of grass and it would just, it rolled right over top of us and didn't change a thing. Um, that being said, um, let's talk about, you know, Narcisse Theater Company first. Um, we viewed this time to go ahead and to, to uh, expand. 2019-2020 uh, was that was a, our biggest season so far. We had just completed um, doing um, our production of uh, Waiting for Godot earlier that year. We had produced uh, Liz, um, Kurt, Liz P. Curtis's One Woman Show, Liz Afrenia, a few months after that. Um, at the time of the lock, when the lockdown started, I was directing um, An Enemy of the People at um, Gammon Theater Company. And we got, we got closed down, we closed down our last week, which, you know, we agree, you know, an enemy of the people, if you're familiar with it, you know, we ended up living that for the next nine months afterwards. <laughs> and um, so it was really, really yeah. poignant at that point. We're always looking back at it now. And um, so during this time, um, what we've done is used it wisely. We're, um, right now we're in a process of attaining our 501c3. And so we become a fully accredited nonprofit of tax exempt stat, um, a nonprofit tax exempt status. Um, up until this point, um, Narcisse Theater Company, we have been primarily working out of uh, Harrisburg Midtown Arts Center. We've created our own stage and area in the basement as we performed uh, Waiting for Godot. And, um, you know, but uh, we're looking, you know, since our inception five years ago, it's always been our goal to want to change sustainability. And to do that, we had to find a home, uh, a home up for the old girl, a home of our own, uh, a home for our, our own home. So, you know, with that time we've been, you know, we've been applying for grants. We've been, uh, uh, and we've been preparing for our 2020 season, uh, which is, you know, compared to 2019, I'm sorry, 2021 season, which is going to be our biggest, um, our biggest, our most adventurous, let's just say our most adventurous season yet. Well, we're going to be, um, sorry, uh, uh, between um, uh, September 3rd to September 10th, we're going to be doing an outdoor performances of, uh, um, at a uh, 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 Rashomon by, um, uh, uh, written by, uh, written story by Ryanusuke Akutagawa. Um, uh, this version of play is by uh, Faye Hamill. And uh, it's gonna be absolutely free to the public. And uh, like I said, we're gonna be doing that uh, starting Labor Day through the 10th. Um, yes, yeah, through the 10th. Sorry, September 3rd through 10th. And um, so all of our, you know, you know, that's gonna be a pretty huge project for us. So up until this point, that's all we you know, that's what we've been do doing since about June. I'm sorry, yeah, well, June of last year. Okay. And how many, how many are in your company? How many people? Right now, there's about, there are 12 of us. Okay. There 12, I mean, yeah, there are about 12 of us right now. Right now, I'm the only one that works on it full time. Um, yeah. One thing that COVID has, this time, to, uh, you know, to help build the company, I've decided, you know, in my day job, I'm not going back. This is what I'm going to be doing for here on, from here on out. 
This wow. is when, and COVID has, <laughs> and because of this time off that, you know, I was able to make that decision and thinking, you know what, I could probably do better on myself, do better by myself than what I was doing before. So, you know, we're all, you know, and, you know, we're just all doing it for the love of it, we're doing it for the community, you know. Um, and another thing is, you know, part of our, our you know, our mission is that 50% of all productions are original play by local playwrights. So what this time is, you know, I've received tons and tons of plays. I've been doing a lot of reading, a lot, a lot of reading. And that, you know, I've only been doing this for, you know, I've been like, you know, this, we started this five years ago. And as a, I mean, I've been an actor for almost 25, oh, over 25 years. And um, I haven't had that much direct, so I've used this time for personal development, you know, hitting the books, learning, like trying to figure out what type of director I want to be and figure out which shows that I think need to be need to be performed. Well, Frank, it sounds like COVID has clarified things for you. I mean, it's, oh, it's so just, good. not wow. complaining, not complaining at all. Wow. I mean, you know, there's a lot to complain about. No, trust me, I have a lot to complain about. Don't get but, it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, there's a lot, you know, our, but my company members, they are of the company members, my colleagues, you know, everybody treats, I mean, has, you know, has been dealing with differently, you know, yeah. you talk about the isolation, that was bad. Yeah. You know, personally, it gave me a lot of time for me to work on my misanthropy. So, you know, also there's, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people, you know, about, you know, there's, you know, the fear, which was real you know, the trauma of it all. But I, I think a lot of times we're thinking, you know, over half a million people died, you know, and still counting. We're not through it yet. No, we're not. You know, so who knows how, it's, I mean, we're not through it. And, you know, you, that's, I mean, half a million, you know, I saw someplace where that was more the deaths, more American deaths than World War One, World War Two, and Vietnam combined. That's right. I mean, that's one, that's a crazy number. But if we look at those things, you know, that's, I mean, my, especially after World War I, when that was like the first time you had that sort of death on such a massive scale, um, an industrial level, like we're having now. You didn't see the great artwork, the great poetry, the great plays, the great art of that, like, you know, of that shared traumatic experience until you got, the people got to the other side. Yeah, yeah. Not that, so that, much now. I think that's the point. I think that we're yeah. we're still going through it. You guys still. are still digesting what's happening, and we ain't through oh, yet. Yeah. We ain't through yet. Yeah. Let's well, we're not. We're not digesting. We're still chewing on. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We're chewing. On it. Right. Yeah. Got it. We're not, we haven't swallowed yet. That's powerful, yeah. Frank. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> you you've heard all of this, I'm sure, and. Uh, so what are your thoughts? How have you been dealing there at Gamut? Well, um, yeah, <laughs> so we, we shut down early. Um, we took the pandemic very seriously from the get-go. Um, we are fortunate in that we have a very large performance space. Um, and the other reason that we are fortunate is that um, in our, we have a core company of actors that work for us full-time that we provide company housing to. So when um, stay at home orders went into effect and we went into lockdown, the actors were locked down together. So they they are their own bubble, their own um, cohort. We call them performing cohorts. Mm -hmm. So over the summer, we started to think about how we could do shows again because the actors could perform together. That was, that was one of the things um, that you know we couldn't bring like actors from individual you know separate households together on stage but our actors could be together and then that made us jump to well what other actors could perform together and harrisburg and central pennsylvania is so rich in um performers who have chosen to live here so um so we planned a show with a, a married couple uh jeff Lettermoser and david ramon Zayas. Uh, and then we planned a show with uh, a family, uh, a mom, dad, and daughter with Robert, Alexis, and Rosie Campbell. Um, and we started to think about what we would have to do to make it safe for the public. And that's what we spent all summer planning. Um, I learned so much 
of stuff that I never thought I'd have to learn about. <laughs> Hydroxyl generators, percent alcohol level of your cleaners, all these, all these kinds of things. Um, but we we opened on September 12th with uh, with a whole new health and safety protocol. Um, normally our space can seat 220. We only uh, had 50 seats max. They were all socially distanced. You could buy a seat uh, as a couple, a single, or a triple. Um, but this all revolved around COVID. And uh, we did a whole risk assessment for Gamut Theater. I became a uh, a, a certified COVID nineteen compliance officer. Oh wow! Um, so I, in addition to everything else I was doing, I was walking around making sure everything was uh, uh, according to Hoyle there. And uh, so we were good. Um, we were basing our uh, ability to perform on numbers of cases per 100,000 people, and also positivity rates. And so we opened with an evening of checkoff comedy in September with the core company. I mean, of course we had tiny audiences, but the audiences that were there just loved it. Uh, and um, then we moved on in October to Edward Albee's The Zoo Story with Jeff and David. It was great. We were all geared up to do the Adventures of Little Red Riding Hood in November. And that's when those numbers just skyrocketed. Yeah. Positivity rates went out. And I was like, what well, we got to for Thanksgiving? And that's right. what happened. <laughs> we got to shut down. So, yeah. so we shut down um, and we continued to do virtual things. We, we sort of had a hybrid approach from the beginning of continuing with um, our virtual shows. Uh, we have a uh, an improv troupe at Gamut called TMI, and they did their monthly show, and they've they've gotten a really great gathering um, for that. We did uh, some of our popcorn at players things online for families, and that's been going very well. Uh, and um, every year we do a partnership production with Sankofa African American Theater Company, and so we had to think really creatively on how to do that, uh, and. And we did. So in March here, there will be two opportunities. I just put a, a link in the chat right. um, to to view our uh, "Do You Know Me," which focuses on some of the change change agents here from Central Pennsylvania um, from early 1800s to the present. Uh, and that's a program that is sponsored by Dolphin County Commissioners and Highmark, and we actually got that out to all the Dolphin County schools and we're doing live talkbacks with them, but we'll have two of those performances online for the public in March. Now the live talkbacks with the kids, is that in Zoom or is that in person? It's a Zoom webinar, oh, okay. yep. yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, everything from when we shut down in November through the end of March is all virtual. But in April, we are going to open back up again. We've gotten to the numbers where uh, it is, is safe to do so. So we'll be doing two one-act plays by Strindberg uh, in April. And then in May, we'll get that little red riding hood <laughs> in. And then in June, we're going back to Free Shakespeare in the Park and we'll be doing Hamlet. Uh, so, so we're excited to be able to be doing things again. Um, we did have to downsize a bit. Um, like Carrie, we're so grateful for government support. And I know that you know part of the national conversation right now is, you know, should the government be supporting artists a little, little more anyway, so that we can yeah. be fulfilling yeah. our missions. Um, and that's, uh, you know, something I'm like, all in favor of if it's possible. Uh, so we, we've we been learning a lot. Uh, this past year, we were supposed to host the Shakespeare Theater Association Conference. Um, that, of course, got canceled, but we are hosting in January 2022. And so um, we're excited. It was over partnering with the Symphony and Market Square Concerts and uh, a lot of a lot of fun things. So you'll be you'll be hearing more about that um Very probably good. towards september but 
lots of fun things in the works. We can't wait. <laughs> I know you can't, but it sounds like you have, again, been resilient. You've been flexible. But more than that, you've learned a new trade. You're now a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly how I feel. <laughs> I'm telling you, you are this folks are really something else. Maria, <laughs> why don't you join the conversation here? The poet, that's what we want to hear. How are you expressing all of this anxiety for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just write the anxiety now. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was thinking about when, how things have evolved, like when we first got shut down, um, if they were saying, just just do this for a couple of weeks, just do this a couple of weeks and everything will be better. <laughs> and so it was extremely scary, but like you had a little light at the end because in two weeks, it's all gonna be over. But uh, as we know, that was nowhere, nowhere near the truth. And so um, when I first, uh, was was home because my my full time job is I work for Capital Area School for the Arts, and um, I had worked there all of like ten days before the shutdown, and uh, when we first went home, I couldn't write. I was really frozen. Um, I was worried about the kids. I was worried about myself. I was worried about my husband. My husband was overseas on on a trip and uh everything got shut down he couldn't come home so i was a huge ball of anxiety um what i what happened with me is the the solitude was not good for me this was not healthy for me that's the way my personality works um what i needed was community so like that first step uh, I watched a documentary about Margaret Atwood and all of a sudden it was like, poosh, like something unlocked. And so I started writing and um, not necessarily great stuff, but it like started coming out. So, and then from there, you know, um, the, the poetry readings in the city, they've been going on for decades um, and they had to stop so they went on zoom and that was what i needed to come back from that darkness and i think a lot of us could say that like that that was the the coping thing to be able to get together even in this format and share what we're writing or share that we can't write or share you know what our day was like um and I think that has been a, a great blessing. I, I honestly hear what you're saying. You're saying actually uh, similar to what Ashley was saying that she initially couldn't express it, didn't do so good for her. But you know, it makes sense because artists need community. <laughs> I mean, you're all about connecting community. So when that gets shut off, of course, yeah. it's, it's going to be hard for you to tap into, you know, that creativity, I guess. Huh. Well, yeah. you came back though. You helped us out at the MLK thing. So you did a great <laughs> job with that. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have an entire manuscript, 86 pages, which is really good for poetry. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, and it's and it's all about the dumpster fire we just like we're right. we're in, you know? And um it's called Rage Rage because not only did we feel the rage against our neighbors and our families who we're sick of being next to. <laughs> um, the rage against systematic injustice, uh, the uh, and racism, the rage against inequality, the rage against um, the politicians, and and also rage, rage against the dying of the light. Like I have an underlying condition. I look like the first person to die on, on Grey's Anatomy and all those shows that are covering this pandemic. I, she looks like me and that is me. And with um, my underlying health conditions, this wasn't just an annoyance or something. This was fearing for my life. Yeah. And so, so it is a very serious thing, um, but I, what I appreciate is how creative people have gotten 
with coping with it and then and how they've um how they've really adapted new ways of doing things yeah yeah, we're and hearing that. We're definitely board. hearing that adaptivity and the flexibility and the resilience, right? Yes. So Dana, Dana, let's bring you in. Dana, you've you've sat patiently and quietly and listened to our artists, the ones that you're here to support. So share with us. I mean, is this does this resonate? Is this what you're hearing from artists across the, the state? And do you feel like you're you're in a position or the state is able to help or has done as much as it can to help? So um First, um, it, it, it does, uh, there have been a wide range of responses from artists and art organizations uh, as to how, they've, uh, how they're doing. We've convened, uh, last June, we started convening our grantees via discipline and program and you know, just had conversations and let them, uh, let them talk, let them tell us how they're doing. And, you know, one of the surprising things to me was how resilient that there's that word, how resilient some organizations uh, were, you know, everybody, um, everybody suffers, you know, from this, this drastic change um, that we, you know, that affect us all. But, you know, I've gotten responses from organizations that have said, you know, um, we've, we've had since we can't, you know, we can't do any program, we can't do any programming, no presentations, but what, we're, what we were able to do was to work with our board a bit more. We got to know our board uh, a bit more. We were able to work together to create a financial plan, a fundraising plan. A lot of organizations immediately transitioned virtually, um, some at a much higher level, meaning they had access to uh, resources, you know, knowledge uh, about what platforms to use, how to monetize the activities that they were presenting virtually. Mostly all of the organizations who did um, present virtually, one of the things that they said is, you know, we got uh, audiences from all over the world. So, you know, it's sort of like a really great starting point. Um, a lot of organizations partnered with other local organizations to uh, figure out how they could present their uh, work again. Um, a lot of organizations and a lot of artists are very supportive of one another. That's another thing that, um, you know, like sharing resources, how to do this, how to do that. Um, it, you know, during, um, I would say, from May, probably April, you know, the funding community uh, responded immediately. You know, a lot of people responded immediately and, you know, set up special funds to help artists and art organizations uh, during the pandemic. And it really depends on uh, what type of organization, what type of funding organization it is. That, that will tell you how quickly um, different funding opportunities can be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to distribute COVID-related funds uh, to our grantees. Uh, and these funds came from like, the NEA. Uh, some of the funds came from uh, the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. Uh, these are regional, there are regional um, funders across the country that receive funding from larger entities and uh, we were able to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we were able to, um, you know, we're a government agency. So uh, when we make changes, it still takes a long time. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a process that we have to go to, but it doesn't mean um, that, you know, internally that we just automatically transition to, um, you know, what can we do? How are our grantees? You know, what are the things that we can change to help them? You know, these conversations that we had with the grantees were great because uh, one of the things that we were able to do for our uh, 2021 uh, program period was to um, be a bit more flexible on the, the allocation of funds. You know, some of the programs uh, require a match. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you receive a certain amount, you 
have to match that amount 100% or maybe 50%. Um, and some of the organizations, so, you know, we were able to waive that requirement uh, this year. And then um, some of the organizations, you know, who had transitioned to virtual programming. So one of the things that you need for that, you need good hardware. Oh, yeah. You need good software. You know, there are platforms that you want a platform that you can use to present programming that doesn't cause issues with ownership of the art, of the works. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. When you're talking about virtual performances, depending on what kind of um, performance or programming it is, there's lighting design, there's sound, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just like a production. And all of those things cost. And, um, it, you know, some organizations, you know, aren't ready for that. But maybe if they can uh, allocate funds for one use to that, then that helps them out. So that was a big thing for us uh, to be able to do things like that. Um, we are also in the midst of, we are in the midst of our strategic plan. So our 2019, 2024 strategic plan. And, you know, we work, we're still working straight through and, you know, on our strategic plan goals. And, um, you know, I mentioned that because what that means uh, for some artists is one of our themes is we look at the arts economy. We look at art, artists as entrepreneurs. Mm. So we look at, we're looking at the field and, you know, in a very, in a new way. And, you know, as long as we keep working and we get the support, you know, that we need and uh, we continue to create partnerships with other funding entities, I think that everyone will see a really good change in, you know, how we invest in artists and the arts economy. Very good. Very. Have you have you gotten enough support from the federal government too? You mentioned some NEA grants, right? Are you getting enough support that, that might be able to be funneled down to the artists locally? So, um, <laughs> There's never such thing as enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're right. <laughs> um, but so um, it really depends on, so we're able to fund organizations. Uh, we fund um, individual artists through partnerships. The state does not fund individual artists. Uh, but when I talk about artists as entrepreneurs right. and how we look at the arts economy differently, that's where the individual artist comes into play. And that's where we're going to see some change in that. Uh, so that's, that's coming soon, those, those kind of opportunities. You know, for instance, um, artists need funds to have professional grade portfolios, right? Um, and, you know, those are the kind of investments that we're, um, that we like to do. It's not just that it's, um, you know, artists and their businesses, mm -hmm. you know, artists support investing in artists and their work, uh, those kind of things. So those are the kind of things that, uh, we're looking to implement with, um, partnerships. Now, it, you know, the NEA funds, uh, they provide us with, uh, uh, maybe a ninth, a portion of our budget, right? But what the NEA is able to do is dependent on their budget. You know, they're a line item on the budget, you know, uh, on the federal budget, just as we are a line item on the state budget. And, um, uh, you know, they're um, focusing on, um, they focused on COVID relief from the beginning. You know, all of us, you know, at the beginning, I'm not quite sure how many of you noticed, but at the beginning, uh, you know, like April and May, you know, every time you looked at an email or, you know, checked into a webinar, there was a new funding opportunity or there was new, you know, there was, there was a, a, a new round of this, there was new information and it was just so much, um, so much information coming through and the NEA uh, was able to provide us with some support through that. Um, some of the larger foundations, uh, you know, like the A.W. Mellon Foundation in New York and, you know, uh, Doris Duke Foundation, some of those really large foundations stepped up 
and um, provided funding opportunities throughout the country uh, in that. I wonder, is there a clearinghouse or a place that these artists, if they're looking for funding, if they're looking for, is there a one-stop shop place people can go now, or is that something that we need to do? No, there is, and there, okay. there are. So one of the things that uh, you can do is to go to our website, and that's arts.pa.gov. Right. Arts.pa.gov. Okay. Right. Arts.pa.gov. So we have uh, a resource section. We have a COVID resource section, and it has uh, it. You know, it's updated. It was created by one of my colleagues, Sarah Merritt, and it's updated. It's been updated constantly, and um, it, you know, just with all information re regarding COVID, and you know, all of the uh, opportunities that are coming out. So, you know, a lot of organizations were able to take advantage of those um, loans from the government. Mm -hmm. And you know, to su it surprised me because some of the organizations, um, you know, one of the programs that I uh, manage uh, is uh, the Preserving Diverse Cultures Division. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, artists and art organizations of color are the least likely to be able to bounce back uh, from uh, economic disparity and, and, you know, situations like this. And, you know, everybody was just sort of on it. You know, everybody was just, they did their research. They were very aware of, you know, the opportunities that uh, were out there and they just stuck to it. So this resource that we have on our website uh, has all the up updated information that um, anyone would need uh, regarding uh, any type of support um, for artists and art organizations. Uh, during this time. So that's one thing. And then, you know, some of the resources in this uh, document, it is uh, PCA tips and resources guide for reopening safely, but it has a lot more to it. And there are links to um, local and national resources. And I think that that's a great start. Absolutely. That, well, um, let me do, I'm going to pull out everyone in so we can have a kind of uh, just a general conversation, but uh, I'm going to, and I'm going to save the question that uh, Candace has put there for last, because that's a great way to end. It'll let us live on a, uh, end on a high note, but I, I want to share first a few of the comments that have come in. Virginia is saying there's so little science-based research on COVID-19 and artists. She says, vaccines alone will not stop the spread of this virus alone. So I, I guess what she's saying is that, you know, so many of your patrons, the people who would come out are just don't, just don't trust that they can come and sit and, and not get sick, right? I mean, even though I know Melissa has become a scientist <laughs> and she's taken it very seriously, the truth is for someone like me, when I hear that from Melissa, I have more confidence going to Gamut, but I wonder, are the other places taking it that seriously? You, we heard with Carrie, she's got sanitizer everywhere. But that's the question people have, are, are we really being serious about this? Have we even heard from Raina? She's serious, but so many people aren't. Um, and you know, at least that's what we're hearing. And then uh, Maria was saying today, I was thinking someone should do a coffee table book of just nose and mouth because we've forgotten people's whole faces. <laughs> she says she's a photographer though. So, uh, though, so y'all can have that one for free. Okay. But you're right. Sometimes, well, here's the other thing, guys, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What if we did some sort of webinar that talked about arts and technology? How the how artists now can be can can use technology better? Uh, how how to do the Zoom? How to focus your work? How, would that be of help, or you guys feel you're getting all of that already, Maria? I I think that that would be um, great. We we had a play planned for um, November. 2020 and as it got closer and closer i was like this is not going to change we have to figure something else out so um we were able to learn <laughs> um and my director she's brilliant janet bixler and she was able to to uh do the whole show on zoom and um it, and it worked out fine we were able to have a full cast and and um 
use it in a really great way that I would not have, have thought of on my own because I'm not a director anyway. But um, it, it worked out really great. So there, it so like people think they can. Stuff. It sounds like she could do some sort of tutorial. On she would be a great uh -huh. resource for Excellent. people. Frank, mm -hmm. how, how about you? You feel like that would benefit you as an artist to be able to have someone talking through what we've learned about the arts and technology? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate to be this guy. Uh, who, what was the name of the person who wrote the question? Uh, no, that was my question. Unless you mean- Oh, oh okay, okay, all right. Okay, all right, yeah, okay. If we don't, I mean, the question in itself is a little problematic. If you don't, if you're saying your statement is, we don't know about, you know, the vaccine or the virus. Oh, you mean you that one, the first one. Okay, you mean the vaccine question. People not, yeah. not confident, okay. Yeah, let, let me address that one first. Okay. Um. Yeah. If, if we don't know, like, you know, the extent of the efficacy of the vaccine, then we can't make any, like, you know, make proclamations that something will or will not work. You know, it is logically saying that. Okay. I'd say I hate to be that guy. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, something, you know, we decided in, you know, very early on, you know, that we weren't going to risk it. You know, that, it, it, you know, yes, we love doing, we love performing, we love expressing ourselves as artists, but, you know, at what point, what's, at what price? Mm. You know, we decided that, you know, for our next production, Rashomon, we thought, okay, we, we made that decision and, during, you know, early, like, you know, like last June, we decided that this is going to be our next project. And it was all to this, this very moment, it's all contingent upon what's going on in the world. You know, if there's a spike a week before the show, go, I mean, our show, our project, our show would go up, you know, and it, it, it became like, you know, irresponsible to keep going on, then, you know, you gotta, you know, have that discipline to say, okay, we're shutting it down. Well, let, let, me, you know? let me bring in Matthew with that too, to, just to give people a chance to talk. Is that, are you in that same situation that you've got to watch every single day to see how these numbers are doing? We watch very often and very closely. Um, so our musicians, of course, because they're they're affected by all this too, right? Uh, we have specific protocols that they reinforce and, and revise every, two weeks before each recording session. Uh, and you may notice that we have not announced anything before we absolutely know it's going to happen. So we're not announcing anything past, uh, well, we had a concert that broadcast was closed this past Saturday. There's one coming up in March, but I'm not going to say anything about it until I know it's actually done. Uh, we, I think that served us well, but yes, it's sort of a moving target. Uh, we had a moment in December when we thought things were going to, you know, and then we had to pull back. Um, yeah. How about so you, Melissa, Carrie? How, Melissa, you, you're you also just a waiting, wait and see, or are you? We, um, I monitor daily what's going on. So I'm watching the trends and that's why we came up with being able to open in April. However, it, it, when you buy a ticket from us, you click a thing that says, I understand that this show may be canceled the show you know, may because you have to be able to do that. Like if somebody gets exposed and, you know, within your cast or production team or, you know, you just have to be ready to close down if you have sure. to. Carrie, uh, is, are you in the same situation? Just watching let's see if i can unmute you wait sorry we i think we crossed each other go ahead and unmute again carrie all right okay mm -hmm. okay yeah well we, we are definitely open and we we have our classes going and everyone has to wear masks and everybody has to uh, practice social distancing. And we do, we're doing a hybrid kind of thing. Rachel is, is doing a, a video of each exhibit. And so we are available on, uh, on, our, face, on our Facebook and our website. So as but, far as you can see, you're gonna keep this hybrid. That's not gonna be- Yeah, okay. that's, that's what we're doing. Number. We're doing a hybrid. Okay. But okay. uh, our, our gala is going to be virtual on May 8th. Okay. So, right. no, but 
we believe we believe fully that the art has to be seen in person. We are open. Oh, there's Gimli again. I'm sorry about that. It's right. We are open seven days a week, and we want people to come in. So we're not showing every single piece of art in our show online. We're not Amazon. People are not going to click on a piece of art and say, I want to buy it. No, that's not what we're about. We're doing a video tour of the whole show. And we want people to come in then and see, see pieces. Yeah. And we are, we're doing a hybrid thing. And that's what we think is important. We're not, we're not completely going virtual. We, right. We're doing a hybrid. Raina and Ashley, I want to bring you in here about that, but also just about would you benefit from some sort of webinars uh, on arts and technology? Raina? Yeah, she says, yes, she would. <laughs> okay. How about? You know, I think that um, yeah, yeah, traditionally, and 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 you know, we can generalize all night long. You're, you're always going to have exceptions to that. And, and I'm super impressed with the artists who have mastered technology. Traditionally, you know, artists aren't always great with technology, right? Like we right. we are uh, empathetic human beings who, you know, the reason that we're artists is because, you know, we use art to sort of transcend and connect and, and that is our means of primary communication, right? Not typically technology. Um, so, you know, even if the folks here tonight are, are, are making do, I have no doubt that there's a plethora of artists out there who would benefit from something like Got that. Got it. Okay. That's what we need because this maybe that's the next thing to kind of feed into you. Here's the next level in technology. Okay. We're going to have to bring it to a close. I could talk to you guys all night because you're just such interesting people, but here's what we're going to close. I'm going to let everybody quickly go around and here's what we want you to address. Will the arts ever be the same or is this changed forever because you cannot ignore that you've now as i think dana said have all these now thousands of people that could possibly watch what you're doing right are you going to figure out a way to keep online even as you return to it in person and what is your silver lining behind this crisis so who wants to start if not i'll call on you all right melissa will start go ahead those two issues yeah, so I, I think as far as changes, I think one thing that we examined was just how, what a ridiculous kind of rehearsal schedule we had prior um, to the pandemic. And so we're looking at like how to proceed in a more sane manner. Um, and I would say a silver lining was just having the time to to think, I dropped in the chat at one point, but we spent a lot of time going over how we do things, why we do things, and and how to make it benefit the people that are working for us. Um, and being able to shine a light on um, anti-racism this year, I think, has been uh, an extraordinary opportunity to sort of get your ducks in a row before you open back up and, and be able to address some of these things that are just that are happening and you want to make a difference about so bravo melissa bravo reina reina will art ever be the same and your silver lining no it won't okay no it will not be and it should never be the same this is the best moment to empower us as younger artists i see a lot more enthusiasm and energy People want to own their own galleries now. They want to own their own art. They want to leave a legacy behind. And so most of us have trouble kind of communicating in this format. So it's a teaching moment here, going in the galleries. There's nothing like going to an opening, smelling the paint, seeing the energy, and talking to people. If you're an artist like myself, I like to get very close to art, but we have to move forward. The new normal in the art community is here and I look forward to it. I embrace it. Thank you. Wow, Raina, wow, you've got me inspired. Matthew, can you follow that? Yes. <laughs> I can't follow that, but if, you, if I have to, um, it, music is not gonna be the same. 
but music is going to be the same. We're, that doesn't make sense. We're not going to give up the good parts. When you miss something that you're, when you're deprived of something like live performance, I think it makes you want it more. But what we do know is that we've tried reaching people online, which was always on our to-do list and we never quite got there. We were forced to do it and it worked. And I know that we've reached more people. Yeah. I know that it, it doesn't, the whole monetizing system is not the same as buying a ticket, but we're getting to more people and also people outside of the United States. We know this for sure. So that's gonna stick with us. Very good, very good. So that's your silver lining. Ashley, how about you? <laughs> Um, you know, no, I, I, I agree with everyone else. I don't think it's going to be the same. Um, but to, you know, like, like Rena, that's, that's a good thing. And, and to me, we've been able to really take a look at accessibility, right? Um, reaching audiences who, you know, aren't comfortable in public and social places, even before the pandemic, right? Or, or they have conditions that, you know, keep them at home, or they have crazy work schedules, and, you know, and, and we're reaching more people by, by including these methods of communication, and, and I think that's a silver lining in and of itself. Bravo. Carrie, you want to, what's your silver lining? Okay. We can't hear you, Carrie. Carrie, you got to unmute again. Carrie, it's still not, it's still muted. We'll come back to you while you, okay, there you go. I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, you are. Oh, I am. Okay. Uh, the Art Association continues to be an in-person kind of place that people right. come in to experience the art. And we, we though, are now embracing more uh, social media. Rachel, our curator, is doing more virtual tours to make our art accessible to more people. So we're, we're doing more as far as a hybrid thing. But art is three-dimensional and we do want people to come in. We're not amazon.com. We don't want people to come in to just look at our exhibits online because that's, we, that's just not art. We do want people to enjoy the exhibits with a, an overview, which our curator is going to do more. That's our silver lining. There is mm -hmm. going to be more online tours, but not, you can't go on our website and zoom in on one painting and say, buy now. That's not <laughs> art. We're not that. We're not Amazon. We're, we're an art association. And well, we Karen, have to combine, combine. Yeah. Hybrid it does seem great. like even for you, it's not the same. It's going to change. It's definitely changed, right? Yeah, it's changing, but not, not badly it's changing in a good way it's a combination where we're always willing to change and to be compromising but we're not going to go totally online that's not us got it all right frank how about you what's your silver lining um well the thing is like how different between most yeah most other uh most other artists like you know for those you know, uh, those of us who are performance artists, um, yeah, artists change. But one thing that we decided NTC, and I want to say first off, I've seen some, I'm amazed by some of the things I've seen other theater companies do and what they've done online and it's brilliant, brilliant work. We decided not to do that at Narcisse Theater Company because, you know, when someday when we do get our, own, our home of our own, we're going to have the big bold letters over like the door to our theater. You know, we are about two things, you know, creating a thing of beauty and evoking an emotional response from our audience. You know, this is, I mean, that's what it's all about for us. And when you're on stage and you're being, creating that thing of beauty, that moment of truth, the audience gets quiet. They lean forward. There's no wrestling of programs. There's no coughing. 
and the energy from the stage comes down to the audience and that audience senses it and they send that energy back on stage for this beautiful feedback loop is just continuing on and on and on. And that's what Narcisse Theater is going to be all about. Has it changed for some? Yes. But we're going to do it the same way that people have been doing it ever since they're sitting around a campfire 10,000 years ago. You know, that's just different stories. Well, so, Frank, you, you have clar clearly you have used this time to dream and to clarify your exactly. problems. Yes. And the silver lining is I was able to go back to school. There you go. You know, there you go. I was able to go back to school on my own in the house and like read as much as I wanted to read. Even on days I didn't feel like reading because you know it wasn't it wasn't downtime. It was locked down, but it is what it was. There you go. Very good, Dana. Silver lining from what you can see. Silver lining and will art ever be the same? So I think it no it won't. Um, and and you know that's sort of like a good thing because you know it's art and the artists that usually uh, document uh, times like this uh, and they help everybody sort of figure it out, you know, no matter what art form it is, you know, artists and art helps us sort of figure out, wow, what just happened? Um, and I think, um, I think that that's a good thing. I think the silver lining um, is that no, it won't be the same. And also for me, the silver lining is, you know, I'm really looking forward to um, uh, figuring out ways to support artists and art organizations and help them transition through this time. You know, some artists and art organizations, they have the resources uh, to transition and some don't. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to, you know, trying to help figure that out. Right, and, I, and I'm looking forward to actually trying to figure out how we can continue to support them in their learning how to deal with these times. So right. stay tuned, guys. We're going to do something else on this. It's, it's so important. So Maria, the poet, is going to mm -hmm. close us out your silver lining. And will your art, will art ever be the same? Well, uh, like, like Dana was saying, um, I think it's great to be able to document this moment. It's, it's great for society to have what we are creating in this moment um my so like i said my manuscript it's all about this moment um <clears throat> and what what we've been going through and what we're learning from it um the silver lining is i think that the doors are uh open for african-american uh writers right now because everyone is taking well not everyone hmm. uh a little more than half the country is taking a look at themselves and trying to be anti-racist. And so because of that, they're like, okay, so let's, are we judging this fairly? And, and I think from that, there have been more opportunities for to get published. Um, so, so that's a big silver lining. And will it be the same? I don't think it will be exactly the same, but I do think one of the great things about using this technology is that you can uh, cast a wider net. Yeah. So like this, this Black History Month, I performed in Georgia, Tennessee, Boston, Philly, and I have not left my house. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, it's, it's really great. Your, your voice can be heard. Uh, much further, a much wider range. So I think very that's true. Amazing. Very true. So that's the silver lining, guys. And I just on behalf of our community, I'm going to speak for the whole community. Thank you for what you do to nurture us. I mean, you don't get thank you for service enough, but thank you for <laughs> what you're doing and, and hang in there. And I do want to say a special thanks to Raina. Wooden, who was the inspiration for this. She's worked with me to try to identify people, to bring people. And so I'm going to be leaning on her with our Global Artists Initiative to help a little bit more. And Candace, okay, uh, there, who's our programming assistant who offered that closing question about the silver lining. So with that, I'm going to thank you all. I will be reaching out to you again. And your ideas, send them to us. The World Affairs Council wants to support you, wants to connect you to the communities as best we can. So Please do enjoy and stay strong, stay healthy, stay creative. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>